Hey friends, it's Thomas here. So today I'm at my friend's place and I'm going to talk about his system. Now my friend, it's uh, not like my other audio friends, uh, audiophile friends. He's somebody who just got a very nice system and he stopped upgrading. Once he got this set up, that's it, man. He, he, he doesn't want to change anything. Uh, I would invite him to go to the trade show with me. He, he would not want to. It's like, that's it. He said that I'm done with audio. I'm just going to enjoy music, listen to music. Uh, I wish I was a bit like him, uh, you know, stop playing around, stop changing gear. So uh, today I'm going to talk about his system. So what do we have here? We have the Onyx CD15 and the Onyx uh, RA125. This used to belong to me. Now, the reason why you have it is because whenever I come across something that is amazing for the price, I try to get my friends to buy it because I know it's good stuff, right? Onyx. Nobody knows about this in Canada, but fortunately, I, uh, I read Chinese. So I have an idea, okay, there's a history to this company. I think the company is no more, but this is good stuff, right? So this combo here was probably about 5,000. I got it dirt cheap because the person who sold it, he couldn't sell it. He imported it from Europe actually, and nobody knows it in Canada. So I, I see him dropping his price. So instead of five, 6,000, I got it for 800 bucks. So when it was time for me to sell it, I told my friends, you know, you should really pick this up. I know I wasn't going to get a lot from it because nobody knows about it. In fact, when I first went to get this, pick up this system, the Onyx uh, CD15, I picked up the remote and I knew it was good stuff. This is super heavy, very high quality. I love the buttons on it. You can throw this at somebody and you can send him to the hospital. It, it's that solidly built. Um, and this can control both units. So the CD15 was my first experience with 192 uh, sample rate. This upsamples uh, CDs to 192. So I remember the first time when I listened to it, I was like, why does this sound better than my uh, DAC? I had the Exasound E18 at the time. I didn't know how to uh, upsample my uh, music files to 192, right? Someday I should do a video on that actually. So for the six months I've been listening to 44K, uh, thinking that I was listening to 192 because, you know, on the box it's written 192 on my DAC, right? Uh, little did I know, you, you need to work on that. Anyway, so this automatically upsamples everything to 192. And it was more crisp, it felt more detailed, the soundstage felt bigger, even though I was listening to the same song. Of course, there's other factors in play, right? CD versus computer and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, I really liked it. I mean, if you look at the buttons, it's, you can tell it's high quality. And, you know, to turn it off, you actually have to mechanically press a button. You can't turn it off with uh, uh, the remote. I don't know why, but I like stuff like this, where you actually have to physically hit the button. You heard the click sound, it's on. I like it. Uh, another good thing about it, 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 it has a USB input, so you can plug your computer to it and use it like a DAC. Now, the matching amp is amazing. So this, the integrated amp, has a very special input for the CD. It's written CD on it, and I noticed the RCA jacks are a little bit bigger. Um, I remember, I think the wiring was a little bit different inside. Uh, you have home theater bypass. Um, the buttons feel really smooth, really solid. I like the design, and it, it runs, I think about 125 watts at uh, eight ohms and 250 watts at four ohm. This is a little bit Right, because as I said, everything is all the manufacturer are trying to get their gear sound with the, having the maximum clarity. And I think that this therefore is a fantastic match with his ELAC UB5 speakers. ELAC UB5. Uh, so when my friend, friend first got it, he called me, I remember uh, he, he messaged me and said, oh, I just bought the ELAC UB5. I checked out on the internet and there's this, reviewer that I really trust and he said that these speakers were fantastic so uh, he ordered it. At the time uh, I just start, started uh, to get into stereo and I went on YouTube and you know I was blown away by all these videos where people say that this is fantastic, it's, com you can compete with a $20,000 speaker. So when he got it and I messaged him so so and you know I was really uh, having high expectation. I was really excited about it and then he just wrote back I wish it had more bass. I was like, huh? I, his lukewarm response to it like made me go like, what? I was expecting him to jump up and down, enjoy that these speakers are the best thing ever. 
but no, he just rolled back. Uh, I wish it had more bass. It's just okay. So I came over and then that's where I realized he had it plugged it uh, in with his um, home theater uh, receiver. Uh, a NAT, I think. And uh, it, anyway, it's, it had about 60, 70 watts. Now I'll tell you what, these speakers are not easy to drive. It's rated at four ohms and 86 or 87 dB. Uh, I'll put it in the description. So the problem is if you have a difficult speaker to drive like this and you plug it to a home theater system that doesn't have the juice to give, give it, then yeah, for sure, it won't sound as good, right? In fact, when I went to the audio show, when I met Andrew Jones, uh, he explained to me his whole idea behind the speaker. He wanted to bring a lot of sound for very little money. And when I was there, I heard the bookshelves, uh, no, the tower version, and they sounded really good. But unlike everybody paying attention to the speaker, I pay attention to the other things, the gear that he's using to drive it. What amp, what preamp, what DAC, right? And I ask him, uh, so Andrew, how much does this setup cost to drive these speakers? It was $5,000, maybe more. So I feel like there's a bit of disconnect here. You're, you're demoing a thousand-ish speaker, in this case, maybe six, 700, these ones, on a $5,000 unit. The target audience might be wrong, right? People who spend five, six hundred dollars buying speaker like this don't have, don't usually get a five, six thousand dollar system like this to drive, right? But that is a, a different discussion. I you know, so I did go on the forums, and yeah, I hear comments where people felt like they were a bit, uh, they find it a bit underwhelming. Um, but I know for sure these speakers are amazing. They are fantastic. When I first started listening to uh, music, I didn't know what to listen for, right? Like these days, yeah, I get it. I, I listen for soundstage, imaging, uh, bass control, decay, and all the blah, blah, blah. That. But this, at the time when I first listened to it, I have no idea what I was listening for. At the time, I, I was just more like, oh, the speaker sounds good. It sounds very smooth. And that was it, right? So he brought this over to my place. I had these at the time. So we plug it in and we listen for two hours. And in that listening session, for the first time in my life, I understood what good separation is, what good imaging is. The instrument separation is insane on these speakers. Like, I never pay attention to this until I listen to these speakers. So for the first time, I understood it. And it was through these speakers. And I, I was kind of pissed because I had the Pioneer S3 EX also designed by Andrew Jones, also has the same concept, the concentric driver, and it did not image as well as this. Another good thing about these speakers, they're not bright. You know, if you look at all the videos I've been producing, I complain about speakers being too bright, the tweeter being too bright. This is the reverse. It's very soft, very, it's very pleasant. It's a musical speaker. It is not an audiophile speaker. Um, I remember we listened to this for two hours. I had my totem forest at the time and then we swap, right? Turn on the to totem forest and my heart sank because the totem forest sounded so harsh, more bright compared to the ELAC. And in my brain at the time, for me, everything is about being smooth to sound good. So I was like, damn it, a totem forest at 4,000 and this sounds better than it? Of course, now it's a little bit different. Now I understand, okay, speaker cable matters, uh, interconnects. I needed to do that to adjust the totem to so that it sounds good, right? But I remember the day when we used this and a, a direct swap like that, I would prefer this over the totem any day, man. I think because of the fact that the speakers are really close to the wall, the bass was actually really uh, strong. Now these are really small woofers, so they're really tight. And that makes me wonder if I had my LS, Kef LS50, my Totem Ember, and my Dying Audio Focus 160, as well as my Harbef, if I, if I were able to have them very close to a wall like this, maybe uh, it would have changed my whole perception on the base uh, from, these book uh, from a bookshelf speaker. So uh, in this room, I think uh, even without a subwoofer, it's uh, it's definitely enough. Uh, if you start adding a sub with the hardwood floor and so forth, maybe there'll be too much reverb. The, the way it is, is pretty good. And this is really not an, uh, the kind of speaker that you would pick apart song. And every time when I come listen here at my friend's place, 
I don't listen to sound anymore. I listen to music. We, I, uh, for those who, who have never seen my video, I separate speakers. Audiophile speakers, musical speakers. Audiophile, you can pick apart the song, like the Kef LS50. Musical speakers, you forget about it. You just enjoy the music. And this is that kind of speaker. Um, he doesn't care much about uh, interconnects cables. However, I lend him my interconnects and that's where it changed his mind. So um, before we get to the interconnects, let me show you, let me talk quickly, show you the uh, turntable he has. He's a, he's a vinyl kind of guy. Um, actually, what the hell is this? Not what? Uh, I don't know the model, but it's the equivalent to the LP120. The LP120? Are you well, sure? No, not, it was no. the Riga P1, no? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, what, what can you say about this turntable? It so, needs a better cartridge. Okay. That's it. That's it? That's it. I mean, uh, I don't, I have nothing to say about this turntable. Um, has a lot of vinyl though. Uh, okay, so let's go to the interconnects, okay? Um, so I lend him my interconnects and like he, it's not that he doesn't believe, he's been using those dollar interconnects from dollar store, right? So when I lent it to him, uh, and it was a very entry level, I think maybe some audio quest or something like that. And it was a shock to him to say, holy cow, interconnect makes a difference. Now, as I said, he doesn't care about gear, but he's a DIY kind of person. He, he can build his own guitar, he can, I don't know, renovate his own basement. He used to work with cable installation. So he understands cables. So that picked his interest. So what he did, he went out to buy gear, like equipment to build his own cable. So he'll order uh, different material from different places and not expensive stuff, right? What did you No, use? it's a uh, coaxial. Coaxial? But it's okay. data cable. Okay, data cable, whatever. So he experimented with it, he built his own cable and that was it. And he, he I don't think he ever used the equipment again, right? So just to show that, um, yeah, cable makes a difference. And even though he's not somebody who's into it, it picked his interest enough that he went researching, he built his own cable, and yeah, that was the end of it. I'll tell you what's really nice about this place is the acoustic. It's not treated, okay? But it sounds really good here. Uh, it could be because of the, what, 15 feet ceiling, to, I don't know, 20, uh, really long room. And uh, I remember the first time I listen to his PSB here with the uh, NAT receiver. It sounded great. I said, damn it, it sounded better than my home. And my speakers are like maybe four times the price of his, but it sounded as good, if not better than my home with a crappy NAT receiver. And I said, maybe it's the room. Room does make a big difference. All right, so uh, I, I'll, I'll wrap it up, but I'd like to show you his other things. The webbing. Okay, the webbings. That's to crimp these kind of connectors. Mm -hmm. All right, these are fixing gauge. So they're just any, just these are coaxial cables then? Yep, this is actually for cable TV or satellite use. Okay. What, what you're looking at is RG58U is the type of mm -hmm. connector. Mm -hmm. And then it's 70, uh, yes. and that's, that's just dual connector. Dual connector. Just wanted to showcase like the different kind of cable you can use to build it, right? What? You're actually taking it apart to show? This is actually a shielded two mm -hmm. conductor. Oh, wow. So what you do mm -hmm. is you have to take the shield mm -hmm. and you attach it to, to the negative and then that goes on the center post of your RCA. Okay, I see. And the closer to the jacket you do it, the yeah. better because of the shielding. I see. But the coaxial, the bottom one here, is your favorite, right? Uh, yeah, pretty sure that's the one. So, why didn't you try uh, electric cables, phone cables? Why didn't you? Because they're not twisted. Well, you could theoretically try data wire, like mm -hmm. twisted pair. Okay. And then join up, but I don't think it's, because it, it's a solid conductor cable and it's not flexible. Okay. So, you've got this too. So, okay. Which is... Uh, I don't remember what this is. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a coaxial butt. Mm -hmm. It's a coaxial with stranded core. Oh, I see. 
So you can solder this, no so, problem, and it's. So how does it sound? This one. Um, 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 well, I don't remember what I gave you, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember which one I'm using. Uh -huh. But I'm pretty sure I'm using a solid core because it's very inflexible with mm -hmm. the with the components. Okay. Like as a matter of fact, you compo you have to have enough room to put your interconnects right. so that they don't bend. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. more solid a cable you go, the less room you you have in your cabinet. Yeah. But they're not expensive, right? Everything No, here... no, I get this at your neighborhood electronics store. Same place you get switches, capacitors, you know, like what Radio Shack used to be. Right, right, right. So no fancy cable with you. No. And yeah. I make them fancy by using the the braiding and shrink tube. Uh-huh. But that's just for looks though, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, you yeah them they, they look really good. Holy cow! Yeah, yeah. And because you make them yourself, you could try. You could try the different. And I got this all on the web. Right, right. Di people trying different things, and so I you... found that the coaxial cable, solid core, was the best. I see. In in my opinion, it it allowed the lows to to come through better. Mm -hmm. And I found that the twisted pair one was, if I remember correctly, because it's, uh, what, a year ago now? Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, it was too bright. It sounded glassy. Yeah. Plus, you play the, the guitar, so you know how, you know, you know what to listen for, right? So you have good ears. And I, I, used to, I used to do sound engineering. You used to do sound engineering? So, okay, that's yeah, why I you can play. demo tapes for bands and stuff. Right. So, okay. All right, guys. So, uh, here's my sound engineer friend. Well, I used to. Uh, I'll speak to you next time then. Well, for him, cable makes a difference. Oh well. <laughs>